nature of it. Uh, again, the resolution is not very good with this projector, but it's crystal clear. And it followed him. And I, it's interesting because last year from the French government, I got a drawing of a craft identical to this that was drawn by someone who had a close encounter in 1968, I believe, 66 or 68 in, in France. And that was released by the French uh, space agency, Japan, um, after Disclosure Project got them en encouraged to do so. Um, now, <laughs> this is a classic one that I showed yesterday. Um, but I think a lot of people weren't here. I do want to show it just to give you a sense of what happened. We were, uh, did a, a one-day training uh, out on the beach near Pensacola. And these appeared. Yeah, these, well, he went in the same uh, signal. Watch. Can we turn off these spotlights? Um, ah, and, oh, oh, my God. <laughs> there it goes. One, two, three. Yeah. There eventually were four that came. Oh, that's better. And they were 30 to 40 foot there diameter see, see. craft. <laughs> very, very close. This is just an old Hi8 camera. We have a confirmed CE5. And then they were signaling to us as we signaled to it. Look at that star. They are making a triangle. They were sort of a reddish orange with a sort of blue corona, and they were uh, disc shaped. And oh, look! Did you see it do that? It's like look, the, the top one. They're they're signaling. They are floating towards us. We had two Air Force uh, pilots with us. These were silent, moving against a pretty stiff wind. There are three there. I have confirmed that there are three. Do we? Got them. I've got them. What's interesting about this that isn't captured on film Hallelujah. is that as they were approaching, the ETs dematerialized from the craft and appeared in the parking lot as these sort of astral etheric forms. And the people who saw that were so freaked out, there were some women jumped in their pickup truck and roared back to town. Um, uh, and that, that was very real, and our electronics were going off there as well. Here's an object of a person that we trained was in Santa Fe, and she was doing a contact, inviting them to come. And she felt them and, and just took her camera, this is the daytime, and took a picture of this object uh, moving very quickly um, and outside Santa Fe, New Mexico. Seamless, it has no uh, rivet structures, but it's a, a sort of a domed disc. Some little, little things here. It looks like a CSA triangle there. But there's, uh, this was moving, they think, at about 500 miles per hour. It's been analyzed very thoroughly. Um, and these, these sort of things happen to our team members all over the world all the time. Um, and one of the things, uh, I want to show this one, because when I decided to move near Thomas Jefferson's home, those of you who don't know, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and his home is Monticello near the University of Virginia, and I have a farm there. The day I decided to move there, this appeared in a field six years after the one in England, and it's the best crop circle ever in North America, and it's a, it, it's a variation on a theme of the Seti Triangle, which you know, we could do a whole five-hour thing on this triangular shape, tetrahedrons, pyramids, a sacred geometry. But this appeared in the field of the man who sold us the house that we bought, the farm that we bought, on his family's property. <clears throat> it was the ET saying, welcome. This was on the front page of the local paper, by the way, that crop circle. Um, now, one of the things that was, uh, I'm going to, let's see. I want to show this picture for a tra good transdimensional one. A couple weeks before we did the National Press Club event, where there were nearly a billion people who saw these top secret military people 
at the National Press Club in Washington, we went to Joshua Tree uh, to make contact and to invite the ETs to guide and protect us. <clears throat> and we went to a cave that Raven had found. And as we left, this appeared, this beautiful cobalt blue transit. It wasn't fully materialized. And this is the spirit of Sherry Adamack, who is my dear friend and who helped me start this project in the early 90s. And she was murdered by Majestic. I and she and Congressman Schiff all got metastatic cancer, and, and Bill Colby was murdered. Um, I'm the only person left living from those early days. And I have a bit of survivor guilt, I guess. But Sherry was there in spirit right above the cave where we had done a puja uh, and meditation for universal peace. Um, what we're doing is just so beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, it will change your life forever. Now at Shasta, uh, a few years ago, about five years ago, some tones appeared all around us. And in the tones, very similar to the crop circle tones. And when this came out of, we were in a meditation inviting the ETs to come. Every person who heard it saw in their mental imaging the spheres, a group of spheres moving along that were ET vehicles. And so this was like a Vedic manifestation. With the naked eye, you could see nothing. But in your mental image, you actually saw the craft. And this is the tone that created the image in your mind. This is really amazing technology the ETs have. When we were at Joshua Tree about two months ago, uh, we actually had these tones and also the tones from the crop circles that appeared at the site where I did a puja and out in the middle of the National Forest. It was amazing. Um, and we have recording of that as well, but it didn't make it into this yet. This is a really uh, uh, amazing uh, thing that came into, onto my farm. We had a training there uh, a couple years ago in 06, about five years ago, four and a half. And this thing came out of space. I'm looking up. This is me. This is uh, Dr. Bravo. And look, <laughs> and there's uh, an extraterrestrial communication probe that then I actually saw the craft above us. You can see me looking up. And this thing comes in, and then it's there in a trans-dimensional way. And it's a trans-dimensional electronic device that was scanning the group. It was in the center of the group. We're in a circle. And this is what came in. And we've had many of these come in. Uh, that you can see with your naked eye, but they're very fast. This came in from space, uh, that it was like 1 58th of a second. So you got to really, really be awake. Um, uh, now, one of the things I want to show, because this is, we have a, a person on our team in Australia, is that often the craft will appear in the ultraviolet range, not visible with the naked eye. She took a photograph of a craft that her dog actually wanted. And here is this strange object that was, there was a body of water. And this craft appeared, she could, and it has a blue corona around it. She felt it, but she couldn't see it. So she took a picture with her camera, and this is what was in the film. So frequently, the ETs will be dematerialized, but they'll be there in an energy form, both their craft and their beings, that will be faster than the speed of what your eyes can see. Because remember, your eyes only see a very narrow range of the visible spectrum, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, now, um, I want to go to some of these really cool, cool objects at Shasta. Uh, look at this, these, this one here. Oops, oh well. We can do this one first. And this is with a night scope. In 08, we got this wonderful, uh, very advanced night vision camera hooked to a digital. And this is when uh, a craft came over that has kindness. This is an ET I was introduced to by Sherry after she died. And this thing, look how huge. This, these craft come over and will actually send like a blue beam of light into the group. Uh, at one point in Wyoming, it lit up the whole field where we were, and this craft came over, materialized, and this blue beam of light came. And it's not just light, it's transformative cosmic energy that has within it all kinds of intelligence and information. Let's go to the next one. Oh, here it is. 
And this was at uh, Joshua, this was at the Mount Shasta. Also, this is at Sand Flats when kindness came in. Look at the size of this. And it's very bright. This is my laser, my green laser, uh, signaling to her. And, uh, you know, we have, we go out with a satellite chart so that we, you know, rule out satellites and rule out the iridium ones that flare up and bright. A lot of people don't. And this is one uh, w when it was after any visible satellites that came in uh, right by Mount Shasta and signaled to us. Now, while this is going on, frequently there'll be a trans-dimensional object in the uh, field. And you can actually then see an object that will appear very, very, look how bright, it came right in, very close, how big it is. They're beautiful, very celestial. So what's the next set? You guys like these? We're gonna, okay, um, let, let's go, I wanna show, I, I wanted to show some of these. Um, they're incorrectly called orbs, they're actually craft. Um, this is a mislabel. And I was signaling, and look, boom, look at this thing. So we remote viewed this craft, you really couldn't see anything, and then all of a sudden, it signals back and that is not a satellite, or an aircraft, or swamp gas, or Venus, or Superman. Oh uh, yeah. So this can happen several hundred times a day, a night. Here, look at this that came in, right into the field. The it's a C-City Triangle. This is a ship that came in at the crossing point of light, right at the edge of the speed of light, and it's actually about 100 feet from our group. After this, there were ET beams, there they are again. Look how close they are. This, th these trees are about 100 feet away or less. So these are the kind of phenomena that you see that we're getting. And when this happens, it's very fast. Afterwards, there'll be this energy field. And we can sometimes be out in the desert where it's 30, 40 degrees. And the ET vehicle will begin to materialize around us transdimensionally. And the temperature will go up to 60, 70 degrees. You have to take your coat off. And look at this right here in front of the tree, how quickly. So these are the trans-dimensional entries of craft that are at the edge of the speed of light. Um, and they're partially materialized in this plasma type of energy. And here's one right in the field. And you actually will see it, it's very close. And when you see something like this and you're in the middle of a wilderness, you go, holy Christ. And then you realize with your inner sight and your subtle celestial vision, these are all around us. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to share is uh, the Orion transmissions uh, of a couple years ago. Um, we were out in Joshua Tree, and I had initiated contact using this sphere, crystal. Now they're confirming these are the tones the coming from the Orion this sector. Is the control craft from the deep space, uh, We're in the middle of an 800,000 national park, no electromagnetic signals, cell phones, nothing dead. All of our detectors light. start going off after we make conscious contact. And what we have then are objects that start appearing in the sky and in the it's air around us that are frequency. signaling. Simultaneously. Simultaneously. Now see the craft that is here. The magnetometers and the other electromagnetic detectors at one point went on a complete lock-on for about 23 minutes without a break. Uh, I almost burned them out. <laughs> these are actually, some of these are quite close. They look like they're far away. They're craft that are dematerialized that then materialize and signal briefly around us. This is Orion's sword and belt, and this is uh, Rigel and Beetlejuice. Yet another frequency is it yeah. EM? Yeah. And of course, the Vedas and the ancient Sanskrit knowledge of the mantras and consciousness came from the this sector. My chair Look at this object went straight up, here. not a falling it's star. Right here. You can't hear me. Oh. 
Oh, my God. The book that we just came out with have these on them. There's a DVD that comes with the book. It's called Contact Countdown to Transformation. And it has all of these cases in it up through um, 09. And uh, the DVD has all these images on it uh, that are through 09, not anything after that. We have to come out with a new one now because by the time the, uh, the ink was dry on the printing of that one, we had had so much more contact. It was beautiful. Now, at the last chapter of that book is my translation of the transmissions because there was actually coded information coming from the Orion sector with these tones. And what I did was go into a state where I could understand it in sort of a binary language, and I spoke it. So that's, in, that's the last chapter of the book. Now, uh, this is a, an amazing event that happened. Let's do this one from uh, the Outer Banks from 09. This was about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, we were on the o ocean, and we were making contact. And one of these objects, a huge one, unfortunately, this resolution is horrible, the contrast. But there's a craft here. And the night before, one had come into the ocean that literally lit up the whole sky and went into the ocean. And then following that, there was an object that appeared on the beach as a group. There were three. It was like a C-City triangle of lights, teal blue, a amber, a sort of golden color, and sort of a greenish color. And this craft dematerialized, came out of the ocean, and then materialized there with these beings for an hour. And they signaled to us over 100 times, which is the next one you're going to see. Um, it was, let's see, it's the craft on the beach here. Um, now, with the night scope, you're going to see uh, this is our group. And we're on the barrier islands all on the North Carolina coast. This is what we're going to do uh, in the Gulf Coast uh, next month in Florida, those of you who want to come. There's a, um, this is the horizon of the ocean. Those are the waves. And this, is, this thing started happening right literally 90 feet from us. We walked it off. At the conclusion of the hour, I actually went out to where this dematerialized craft was, where these objects were signaling. You're going to see them in a moment. Um, there. Just did it again. Yes, it just, it just signaled, right? That this, uh, oh, again. And Everyone did saw this with it? the naked eye. This is on the beach. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very close to where the waves are breaking. It's yes. right out there. That, oh, there, there it again. went. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. below, there, oh, yeah, right there. See how close there? Now, there's nothing there. It's, it's just sand. And, and empty air, and people say, well, what is this? I said, well, it's an ET craft with beings there that are trying to be safe so that they don't get zapped by the electronics from the secret government satellite systems. And they're there signaling. I walked into this group of ETs and almost dematerialized. People saw me vanish uh, where they could see through me. And I almost went off planet with them, and, but I didn't because I know I'm seconds. still supposed to be here. That is right here on but these are the very God-conscious celestial ETs. These are ones that are, when you're seeing, if you can imagine, your being in a state of, of everyone on the planet, oh these God. are from oh, or in God-consciousness. Very, very large. I think it's, uh, I was gonna say Which is where our civilization large. is headed. Very large. We will soon be a civilization where everyone on this planet is that? in cosmic consciousness. And then we're going to be like Every these folks. Bit. We'll go to other planets helping other worlds. Okay. And so the we're cycle goes on tonight, forever. So. Has everyone seen this at least? But we got some growing twice. up to do first. It's done it about 100 times, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, but, but, but you know, so there. there. It was very bright. It was They're very, they were very bright, bright there. very much with And this is, went on for an right hour. Did you see it? Now, while okay. we're seeing these actual objects on the beach, the, there are objects that are moving around us and all of our detectors are going off, including the magnetometers and what have you. So let's go to the next one. Um, I mean, we have hours and hours of this, so I'm trying to cover. I have to show this thing. This is so astonishing. The, cor the craft that is right in the field and it, it's right at the speed of light. It's almost as fast, a little bit faster than the speed of light. It materializes, dematerializes, and goes right up into space. And oh, oh, my God. That was great. And corkscrews out into space. Watch this one in slow-mo. 
This literally happened. Here it comes. Straight up, turns to the left, dematerializes, right at the edge of being materialized. Todd Goldenbaum did an amazing job with the camera. And here it comes again, right here. And it's actually a spacecraft that's moving at such velocity that it's, and it's big, that it's right. That's the real thing. That is not Lockheed Martin. So um, let's see, let's go to the next. came here at Joshua Tree. This was about 15 months ago, and the orb that I was talking about that approached then uh, and took this picture. There's nobody with a light on, and it lit up this bush and the chairs where we had been sitting. And right behind this third chair is this guy. And this is actually, when, you, when we clean out the pixels, you're going to see this was a tele portation of an ET being. This is his head. This is Pardon? Yeah, they usually give me five. Are you ready back there? TV, and the, this is one goggle and another. This side of his head is brighter than this side because the orb is over here. And this is, looks like a yarmulke. It's a teleportation device that they wear. And this guy's name is Bijou, and he's Go to the next, uh, is it running? Okay, just let it run. Now, it's interesting, look if his nose got lit up really bright, but his, his mouth is here, his chin's here, this is one eye, and this is the other. Look at the size of his, his head from here to here. That would be like from his shoulder to his pelvis. Your head would only cover about a third or half of that. His cranium above the eye, this part of his face is similar to our size proportionally, but from here up, and he's got a concave area here and here, kind of like Worf on the Star Trek series. But this is him right here. Now, he's right at the edge of materializing. This is him. And it's a male, and I know who he is. And this is an orb. And when he appeared, this was uh, the camera had no flash on, nothing, and no one had a light on. And the camera was open maybe three or four seconds. Uh, with a high ISO. And we had invited the ETs to come, and he, he came in transdimensionally. This is not a spirit being. This is an extraterrestrial, biological, but he's being transmitted through an electronic system that would be very similar to your astral body being able to be projected, except it's electronic. Okay? And this is what you need to understand to understand how contact is happening. All throughout the world with the team. Now, when they fully materialized, one time we were at the same site and there were four ETs that fully materialized uh, in the physical, and this is materialized to the point of light, like a light being. But uh, you can see this is, his, this is the dark side of his face, this is the light side where the orb is over here, and this is his hand, left hand. This just shows you the measurements. We measured everything. Uh, the orb is here, this is Mars. But this is actually in the field, and it lit up this whole area where the being is. This is what a flashlight under the same conditions looks like. Very different. Same settings with someone putting a flashlight on. And here's where it was. This is the desert, Joshua Tree. Not far. You guys who live here should go out there. It's awesome. Um, so, next one. Y'all like Bijou? He's, ha he's a great guy. I estimate his IQ, 400 to 500, very enlightened. Um, I'm a moron by comparison. Now, um, I can't remember. Yeah, there's so many. Oh, let's go to this one. It, uh, uh, this past, a few months ago, we were at the Outer Banks again. We're going to be doing this on Marco Island, the Gulf of Mexico, next month. It's going to be amazing because we have a state beach just for our use. And there's an object. Um, and in this, it looks like 
Now you hear the tones. We're out in the middle of Cape Hatteras National Seashore, 100 miles of National Seashore, and our electronics start going off. And all of a sudden, this thing comes in, and it dematerialized, and then it lights up the whole beach with your naked eye, uh, begins to light up. And this thing is, is really an amazing object. Look at that. You can actually see it on the water reflecting. Yes. Now watch how it goes out and vanishes. Boom. It deem it, this is clear. There's nothing here. It actually, this whole ship materialized, and it was kind of a golden amber color. It was celestial. And then it vanishes. And look at this thing. Pulsing, pulsing to contact. And our electronics went nuts, as you could hear. And then there's nothing here. It just literally dematerializes. The people ask me, how many times has C. SETI had contact like this? I said, thousands of times, and I'm not overstating it. Thousands. It's beautiful. Look at this weirdness. And watch what it does. Not an airplane. Boom. See what it did? It came in, boom. Poof. And that was very close, right over the beach. Now, while this was going on, there were some federal uh, rangers harassing me, trying to run us off the beach. And the ETs came in. I'm, they were my guardianships. I know that. When I go to the Pentagon, there's a phalanx of ETs that accompany me. And the remote viewers at the CIA and National Security Agency have told me they see them. They're really scared of them. Those are like 18 feet tall. They make me look like a little wuss, you know. Um, <laughs> spending a week with me is a frightful experience. OK, now, <laughs> shock and awe. Let's see, cosmic shock and awe. We did this one. Um, we don't have time for all this. I'm sorry. We're going to have to skip through some. Um, um, Oh, this is great. A few months ago, we were at Mount Shasta again. We're going to be up there at, at Labor Day this year, if you want to join us. Um, and there was this yeah, yeah. Oh, object God, that it's came very out bright. of the Look mountain. At that. Look how Beautiful. brilliant. Now, this is a, and it has a vertical really area. Bright, it's like the, a star now. Very, like very high. Stars. That's a 14,000 foot peak. So it's probably up about 12,000. And uh, these kept coming yeah. from the mountain. And Everybody then in the field it? around us, there would and be these brilliant and orbs and, and that objects sheer, that we began you know, to film, and the ETs moved around us. A number of people were actually touched on their shoulders and the top of their heads by the ETs as they were doing energy work and with folks. It's really beautiful how, how, how they make contact. And uh, everyone saw this, of course. And w when this is going on, there's a consciousness component of it where they're actually sending and transmitting energy and messages. This isn't just a light, like a car headlight. This actually has cosmic consciousness and energy that's coming from the ETs to people, and people are very affected by it. Um, now, I wanted, I, I, one thing I missed, uh, Raven, was the, um, let's see, the object from, uh, Where is Boca Grande? That would have been BG. Here, let's just do this for a minute. There, when we were, this is very close, so we're going to be a little further south than this, but last year we went to an island called Boca Grande in Florida in February, exactly a year ago. Look at this. This is a still photograph, and this is a, a, a light being, ET, that comes and goes to this woman. It's, I call it the cosmic spermatozoa. It looks like a, but it, we're in meditation, and it actually goes through the group and into this woman and into her crown chakra. And these actually are going around the group doing energy work while we're doing this with these cosmic consciousness beings. Now, this is not a spirit being. You wouldn't get it on a photograph. Uh, this is an actual ET. You can see the, the energy as it's moving through. This is a few second time lapse. So you can see the motion of it very quick. This is a being that appeared on the beach. And look, at the, it has two eyes, and it's a light beam with like a halo around it. Very, very advanced. And it was a refracted, reflected energy beam that came out onto the beach with us. 
And when you see these things with your naked eyes, and it, it, it changes your life forever when you realize how many thousands of species there are who are connected with, this, with the project and who are interested in what we're doing here on Earth at this time. They're here to help and to understand, and we have to join with them, the cosmic forces all coming together. Um, let's see, I want to go to um, the, those of you who didn't, oh, this is interesting. Um, these images here. I showed some of these yesterday, but they're worth showing. And uh, we went to the United Kingdom, to England, to the crop circles, and uh, this object in the center, we're in the very center of a crop circle, appeared over, you see how it kind of came in here, over my, this is my head here, and it came in, and it, in, in a series of just a few seconds, uh, Emery took these pictures, great pictures. These are no flash, regular high-speed setting. Here it is again. And this is extraterrestrial. They're not fully materialized, but we could all feel it, and our electronics were going off. One of them started going off in sort of a, a cadence, sort of a bum, 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 bum. We recorded it. Um, and this object, uh, stayed over my head for uh, several seconds, and so he got it. He got several shots of it um, while these tones were going through the electronics while we were in the middle of this crop circle. So we're going to take a group there this year too. If you want to join us, it's an amazing thing because we actually during the day we go out into the crop circles and I do remote viewing, teaching, and and discussions, and at night we go back and do a puja and make contact while we're sitting in the middle of a crop circle in the middle of the night. It's the most amazing experience. Um, and of course, we end up having helicopters and military jets coming overhead too, but look at this thing go. Isn't that cool? Watch. When you put it in sequence, boom, boom, boom. So, you know, he's stationary, and here this thing is. Um, and what you find is that when you're doing this work, now this is the crop circle, not the one we were in just then, there's another one that appeared the night we arrived in England. And uh, it's very complex, has a sort of a C-SETI motif with a triangle. There, we did our puja right about here. And in the very center of it, when we were there, um, the detectors we put in the very center of the vortex of this crop circle, and they started going off. And as they went off, uh, then, of course, uh, Emery took some photographs, and uh, there were all kinds of objects in the sky, a number of, of very strange uh, sort of chevron-shaped uh, objects that were just at the point of, of materializing. And this was the same crop circle where we uh, did several nights of our contact work at night. Not every night, but uh, about half the nights that we were in England that, this past year, about six months ago. And um, we count in this one photograph, there were 12 of these. And uh, the emotion that you feel when the ETs are there in such numbers and in such consciousness is beautiful. And they're just emerging into trans from trans-dimensional reality, astral, into linear space-time. But remember, if you're going faster than the speed of light across millions of light years of space or thousands of light years of space, you're not using an Exxon fuel tank. And you're not, you're not using a solid rocket booster or the space shuttle. You're dealing with the ancient granddad's rocket and Oldsmobile friends, and that's what we're talking about here. And learning the science of how these ETs are appearing and materializing and how you make contact and consciousness is important. Now here's the puja set. You can see there's a candle on it, and it sort of is glowing here. This is a, in, in the evening. Uh, he's using a, a high ISO, and the shutter's open for a few seconds. But this next picture is very important. What is this? No one had any blue lights on, and the candle's off by now. What's this guy? Comes out of linear, uh, trans-dimensional space-time comes through the crossing point of the fabric of linear space-time, and there's this 
this sort of rod and energy form, and then this blue light over the puja table. These ETs are very drawn to the puja, the Sanskrit, and the mantras we're using because they understand that we're reawakening the world to that ancient knowledge that's been lost. Here's a craft that appeared, and actually in Orange County, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm going to do one of the days I'm going to do a puja, and we're going to go into the mantra meditation in, in great detail and how it sets up the resonant field in consciousness so that you can transcend into unbounded mind. And once you're in unbounded mind, you can see any place in any dimension. And then you invite them to come by showing them your location, and they come. They may come in ways you don't expect, but they always come. Now look at, this is my arm. I'm pointing with my right finger to this. And Emery's so awesome because he listens to me. A lot of people won't listen. And he listens. And I say, and I said, there's a craft over here. And I was telling people I could feel in remote view and sense. So he takes a photograph. This is not retouched. This is daytime, normal, fast speed, uh, very good digital camera, Nikon, something or other. And here's this ship. Now, it's not fully materialized. It's there in a trans-dimensional energy form. But it's there enough that you see it on a regular digital camera. So you can feel it, and you can see it, and you can hear them as well. So the mind, this is a journey in cosmic consciousness and cosmic space. And then these ETs come to us. Now we were at this beautiful, this, from, you can't tell if this was like a multi-dimensional cube. And while we were going in there, look who comes right here, right over that crop circle spherical object with some really strange sort of uh, protrusions on it, very similar to the one from Wichita Falls, Texas in 1992, not exactly the same. Um, and often when we're approaching an area, uh, we do have a lot of military reconnaissance and choppers that are coming around us. There will be ET vehicles that, will, that are our guardian ships. These are guardian vehicles. And the National Reconnaissance Office satellites, the birds up there, day or night, pick these up, and they're going, holy Christ. So right now, we're operating under certain restrictions. Now, this is a time lapse. So that you can see the laser I've been, uh, is in the field here. And, but what is this chevron-shaped thing here? So over this valley, we actually saw, you can see in the picture, everyone's turning, craning their neck. Now this is in, this, uh, in uh, Alton Barnes, England, and we're on an 1,800-acre farm that we get permission, have had permission to use since 92. We're going to go back there this summer. And on the top of it is this big knoll uh, and hill where you can see the whole area. And this is at the epicenter of where the most incredible crop circles have appeared over the years, uh, and not far from where the Cicetti Triangle, that one we showed you earlier. And this is uh, floating right over the valley, very close to us, because this hill is not far away at all. And you see everyone's turn to look. This is another object that appeared right on the edge of the hill. Um, it was a very large spherical craft. It wasn't fully materialized. You can't, it could have been of any shape, but this was the energy signature of it as it was appearing in linear space-time. What's the location of this? Alton Barnes, England. Do you ever see the actual craft itself in the light? Yes. This was, I don't know. You haven't been here. You may have just come in. There was a number of daylight ones that showed the craft. And yeah, of course we do. These were all seen with the naked eye also. And here's a chevron, and then this large object here, right over this next ridge. They're coming right through the edge of the, the crossing point of light. So when the craft are fully materialized in three dimensional, of course they're metallic or what have you, um, they have a different appearance uh, than these light ships. But the, remember when they're in this form, they're much more easily, uh, what can I say, 
able to dematerialize and go beyond the, the reach of a, an electromagnetic weapon. So a lot of people say, well, why don't they just shut all those systems down? <laughs> because then the secret government would say, see, it's the invasion of Earth, not just LA. The ETs are too smart to fall into. Look at this, it's very interesting. And these are close. I mean, these are not uh, far out into space. These are right in the region there, within uh, a few thousand feet of us, low altitude. Now, in the course of doing this, one of the things we've learned is that the more coherent the group is, the more these objects come closer and closer. Now, how far they come into full linear materialization and, and where they would land or something has to do with the security of, of the world and what's being monitored. I can tell you that we're not going to be able to do this uh, without being known. And I can tell you that these objects, if we're seeing them, they're being seen by the eyes in the sky by the National Reconnaissance Office satellite system. So, you know, I ask the ETs to do whatever they're going to do in a way that's safe. There's no reason to do anything that would get anyone injured. Um, and after what happened at Mount Shasta a few years ago, where that uh, scalar weapon was fired across the bow of the ship and my group, I decided that, you know, the ETs, uh, th there's a time for everything. And someday we'll, we'll get all these weapon systems out of uh, the hands of, of the, the people who should never have been allowed to have them. And we'll be able to, um, the ETs will be able to be more uh, physically manifest. But uh, what I tell people is that if you're awake and you understand that in your lucid astral body and conscious body that you can fly and float and go all throughout the cosmos, why can't the ETs do it? And then why can't you meet in that same space? And that's what we're doing. Um, so it can happen on many levels, tone, light, physical manifestation, consciousness. Look at this object. And we're all in meditation. And it kind of, this is right off the edge of the hill here. That's the edge of the hill we're on top of. It's a big flat meadow. beautiful what's coming in. Okay, next, uh, I don't know if there's the next. So we have to go to the next. <clears throat> now, one of the things that uh, is, is really unusual is no matter where in the world we go, the kind of phenomenon that keeps happening. And I wanted to just show uh, a crest stone you saw this sort of triangular object that came to Shasta. We went up to Blanca Peak, and we're going to do this in June. There's a place in Creston, Colorado we go to. It's a sacred mountain of the east for the Native American tribes of that part of the world. Look at this. Boom, boom, boom. See, set a triangle. So tri and this is only a, a maybe a few feet from us. And it kind of appears, and it comes in and out. Now, what's interesting about that, this is the site that if you read the book, uh, contact countdown the transformation is where we had 12 of the extraterrestrial elders from different star systems that in 1997 appeared and asked us to stand down the weapon systems and to do disclosure and this is the exact same site now this just happened about nine months ago 
and it's the exact triangular form of the crop circle, and it's the exact triangular form of the object that was at Mount, Shasta, uh, Mount Shasta, uh, about a, a two years earlier. So this keeps happening, and it also happened at the Outer Banks last year. So we have these, and, and this is an actual craft that's there transdimensionally. If it materialized, it would have been a very large craft, I suspect. But the beings that were there on site were there in their etheric and astral bodies while these objects are, are appearing around us. Anyway, those are some of the images. I have the lights back up. Hope you enjoy those. Oh. So uh, who has the lights? Which one? There are a bunch. Well, they were all materialized. They wouldn't be photographed if they weren't there. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Well, we, we're not, we don't have time to go back through this because I'm, I'm told that we're kind of getting into the, 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 the time limit of what we're supposed to do. But one of the things I want to do before we leave is have an opportunity for folks to ask questions, now just briefly, uh, about a lot of this material. And uh, the things that you need to know to go to the next level of contact, because that's what I really want all of you to learn to do, is to make the contact and to do. Now, the meditations and all that stuff, I mean, it's, it takes hours to go through that training. But those are all on the app, the iPhone app, and they're also all on, and the, on the uh, CSETI site. And what I think that folks have to understand is that as you go through that process, God loves those who work together, right? So it's great if you can do this with a group of people. So the reason for that is that if you understand the work of Dr. Bob John and others, um, when there's one person doing something in consciousness that's a higher state of consciousness, it has a certain effect. If there's two that are unified or love each other, it's an exponentially increase. It's not a linear. It's not like twice as much. So if you have a whole group, and this is the power when we do these expeditions where we have you know, 20 people with us or 25 people all in that state of higher consciousness, it creates a shift in consciousness in the area that is felt throughout the cosmos because it, is, it reaches this point of, uh, of nonlinear acceleration. And so if you're doing this at home and you're wanting to do it, you can do it by yourself. And certainly a lot of people have and have had contact. But if you do it with other people that you have a coherence with and a love for and a, and a friendship with, it creates a certain power. And also people feel safer. You know, if you're out in the middle of the wilderness and you're by yourself and a craft something like one of these flies in, some people get a little freaked out and fear is the spirit killer and the mind killer. So it's very important if you're with other people, you can feel secure with each other. And, it, it, you know, and there's really no reason to be afraid anyway, but it's natural for humans to be a little freaked out when you have something like this approaching at a few hundred feet and you know it's extraterrestrial and it's coming in. You know. So I think that if you do this with three or four or five people that you're close with, it will have a huge effect in, in not only expanding awareness, but making you feel secure as you do the work, so you have friends with you there. So any questions? People have questions. Yes? Yeah, you were saying that Sishkin was talking about, you know, us being left here to be monkey slaves, sort of, <laughs> he sees the one in gold. What's your philosophy and what do you think is the truth about that? Well, certainly human civilization, uh, there have been many civilizations here that predate Sumerian or what have you. Millions of years ago, there were Lemurians, and there were the Mu, and there was Atlantis, and I think those literally existed. Um, in fact, uh, there's a guy who works for the intelligence community who's actually given devices that the CIA and other intelligence uh, officers find that are thousands to millions of years old, and, he, and he's asked to figure out how these work. Okay, So they've been around a long time. The extraterrestrial civilizations that uh, have been involved with the Earth have been involved at different phases. Okay, so millions of years ago, I suspect there was a different civilization here than what we think of Homo sapiens. The most, the modern era, the what we have record of in the last 10,000 years, uh, 
is, is really a, a, a teeny little tip of the iceberg of the existence of intelligent life on this planet. Earth has had life for 700 million years. And I can assure you that the objects, for example, on Mars are in the hundreds of thousands to millions of years old. The pyramids and the objects that are on Mars. This I know to be a fact. Now, a lot of people say, why aren't those disclosed? And I tell people, well, there's a Jet, jet Propulsion Lab scientist who told me that if that was disclosed to exist, even though they're ancient, that it would collapse the orthodox belief systems of every organized religion on Earth. And I said, well, good. <laughs> And he says, no, you don't understand. There's a lot of power in those groups. They do not want it known that there was a connection between the genesis of life on Earth and what had been on Mars and out there in other star systems. So, but no matter how you view it, I think we have to be careful not to sort of do an anthropocentric projection onto things that are in very old scriptures that may not be understood well. There's no reason to think that an interstellar civilization or interplanetary civilization would need to have anyone dig up gold for them. Okay, you know why? Because I know for a personal fact that some of the scientists I'm working with, that you can take some tin and another compound that I don't want to talk about and put it in a microwave at a certain setting and you can turn it into platinum or gold. You don't, so the, the idea, see a lot of these ideas are based on a sort of very, I hate to use the word superstitious, religious thinking that has no foundation whatsoever in the science of an interplanetary civilization. If you understand the science of transdimensional travel, communication, metallurgy, how things are manifest, it becomes an absolute absurdity, the idea that any civilization would need to come to Earth for any material object okay, including our ge the genetic material. So I think that the, the problem becomes, you, you know, I, I, I tell people it's sort of like a cosmic Rorschach test, that and another way of the old Vedic saying, the world is as you are, that if you have within yourself a certain fear paradigm and certain uh, insecurities, you project that onto the ET presence, okay? And I think that's what's happened a lot. I think it says a great deal more about the people making these statements than about the reality historically or the reality currently. And that's what I think we have to examine the book of our own selves to understand how we're going to go forward. Because a lot of that baggage has to be kind of left behind. Because we're in a whole new era. And certainly civilizations that have the ability to do what you saw here and to materialize and dematerialize and appear. And you know, we were at Creston last year and we were setting up our circle in this pristine sandy area near the great sand dunes and sitting right behind my chair was a double pyramid fluorite crystal that the ETs put there. Okay, and they materialized it there. Everyone saw it. Now, I mean, and what, what you have to realize is that there's, they have no need to take anything from us. What they want is our love and conscious peace and cooperation and the transformation of our own civilization so that we don't destroy our planet or become a th further threat to other planets. Because remember, these $2 trillion we've spent in these classified projects have taken things from 1927 when T. Townsend Brown was doing high voltage uh, experiments with anti-gravity and that's, if you go to the orionproject.org, you'll see this, to things that can cross over into transdimensional weapon systems. And so that's what I mean when I say it's not just hydrogen bombs. There are other things that are classified where we become an existential threat to other worlds and to ourselves. And so I think that when we look even historically, there's no foundation to think that there was a civilization that needed to somehow have us digging up gold ore from them out of the ground when they can simply put in an electromagnetic system and manifest it. And that's exactly what I know people at the CIA have programs that have done that. So I, I think that if we have that in 20, we had that in 20th century Earth technology, it's laughable to think that a civilization that's interstellar wouldn't have discovered those same sciences, you see? And so when you think about it, 
a lot of these sort of pejorative and fearful and xenophobic assessments are simply projections of our own cultural heritage of ethnic cleansing and racism and warfare and tribalism. And I think we have to check that for a minute and really think about this so that we don't go stampeding into this future dragging all that superstition and all that negativity. I think that what we have to say is that let's let that go with the dinosaurs, with the old world that's being folded up, and let's put all of our attention on the unfurling of this new world, a world of universal peace, free energy, travel amongst the stars, the ending of poverty on Earth, the creation of a sustainable civilization. And here's the good news. All of that is on the planet now. We don't have to invent it. We don't have to discover it. It's all here. We have to disclose it. We have to unveil it. We have to be the vector to bring it out. So I tell people, let's focus on that. And when we do that, if we take care of that, we're going to find the universe is going to open its arms wide for us. And these civilizations are going to be here in huge numbers. But they're waiting for that. They've been waiting for us to make this leap for 100 years. And now it's time. Yes? My puzzlement's in the other direction. Not just being pissed at man to tolerate or allow themselves to be uh, stymied by a scale of weapons, especially in the early stages, and why they would allow the, the great masses of humanity, which fundamentally has good will, to be deceived by a few hundred psychopathic. Why would they? And that's a very good question, because I think there is a prime directive. It sounds corny. But I don't think it's their it's the, they, they're not here to fix all of our problems. They're here to see us through this, if we can. Now, in a worst case scenario, I think you see a massive intervention. But a worst case scenario is something that we don't need to go into. But it'd be, we're talking about losing five or six billion people. So I think that in a worst case scenario, yes. When we were almost went to mutual assured destruction with the nuclear weapons, if you look at the Disclosure Project top secret witnesses who were at nuclear bases, we found that every single nuclear weapon storage area had been visited by ET vehicles investigating them. And on a number of occasions, they took dozens of intercontinental ballistic missiles offline and rendered them unlaunchable, not just here but in the Soviet Union. Now, of course, to the NORAD and to the Strategic Air Command, this was an act of aggression. But the reason the ETs did it, it was that they were sending a message, don't blow up this beautiful planet. It's sacred. And if you do go down this path of mutual sure destruction, then we will have to intervene. But they don't want to do it overtly. It's like, kind of like invading Afghanistan and thinking we're going to impose Jeffersonian democracy on a feudal medieval society. They know better than that. They're wiser than we are that way. So now, it doesn't mean that they are happy with everything we've done. And when I say that these extraterrestrial vehicles have been hit, it's not like every day. Now, they've been hit pretty several dozen times. At Fort Huachuca, out near Tombstone, Arizona, ironically, it's Army Intelligence Headquarters, there's an underground facility. And one of the members of my team worked in that facility. And there are nine different extraterrestrial vehicles, and the body's autopsied there. So it's not like it happens every day, but it's happened often enough that it's worrisome. That it happens at all is a tragedy. Uh, now, it's sort of like a lot of people say, well, couldn't they protect or that? I said, look, just because they're advanced doesn't make them omniscient. I mean, it's sort of like the gods must be crazy, where you know someone throws a Coke bottle out of an airplane in Africa, and then the people are fighting over this thing. Or the cargo cults in World War II, where we flew planes into areas where they'd never seen an airplane. And we went back, and they had built models uh, out of sticks and sand and, and, and palm fronds uh, in the shape of an airplane and were worshiping it because they thought it was from the gods. I mean, we have to realize that just because they're advanced doesn't mean they're omniscient. There's only one being that's omniscient, and that's the supreme being. And so that means just because they're advanced doesn't mean they can't be caught off guard, that they can't be fooled, that they are not vulnerable. I mean, my god, I mean, you know, it's like, why was Gandhi killed? Couldn't he have seen that? Or why was uh, Christ? Or, you know, and it's not like these are, you know, beings that are They're in the real world. They're, and, when they're, and this is one of the problems. When they're in three-dimensional space-time, they're vulnerable. And now, do they have the ability to, with their devices to see the future and avoid some of these things? Yes. 
That's what Operation Looking Glass and Red Light was all about that we have in the disclosure project, people who worked on some of the ET devices that were able to do that going into the future. But, and that's what we do. I mean, I, one of the reasons I'm still alive is that I look into this, I look around the long horizon. But we're not infallible, and this is the problem is, is that you can't ascribe infallibility to beings, people, worlds, and technologies. Um, so there's not omniscience just because they're advanced. But it'd be a little bit like going back a thousand years and showing somebody um, a 747 or an iPhone or a laser. Now they would think, oh my God, look how advanced they are, aren't they infallible? When in reality, they could still pick up a rock and club you in the head, all right, and kill you. So it, 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 that's a crude analogy. But in real, in the reality of it is, and this is the other part of it, is that the classified programs, it, this isn't 1950s anymore, where you saw craft landing a lot. and people. From the 50s to the 90s, there was an exponential increase in the development of these scalar longitudinal weapons. Now, the question has been asked, and I actually had a senator ask me this, why don't the ETs just come and neutralize all that? Could they? Yes. If they did, if they did, it would look like Independence Day. And the spin meisters in Majestic would say, see, we're under attack by the aliens and therefore let's unite the world under a military junta and go to DEFCON 1, full war for interplanetary war. The ETs know that they, if they stumble into that, there's a tripwire and that will be used against them. <laughs> to the extent that they even went to our ICBMs and rendered them unlaunchable for 30 minutes or a few hours, so there are people now who have taken disclosure project materials and have spun that into showing that there's an alien agenda that's in, an invasion. Because you can take any fact and turn it into two things, okay? Now the people who were there that I interviewed said, we all got the message that they were trying to say, look, please don't blow up this beautiful planet, but if you do, we can stop it. But they don't want to do anything so frontal that it stampedes the people into panic or this secret government into saying, see, Yes, Dr. Greer is right. We're not alone, but they're here to eat you for lunch, and it's invasion Los Angeles. All right, invasion LA, invasion Earth. Remember these movies like Independence Day and all the ones that are coming out right now out of Hollywood are being directed to be funded by members of the cabal from Majestic. Now, I've worked with some of the top producers in this town, and two of them, who if I named them would be household names, wanted to do Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, which is my autobiography, which would be a story of disclosure and contact and a beautiful story. They were stopped. One of them got visited by a CIA guy and a former head of the Department of Energy who knew about this stuff, and the other one had all the money yanked out of the project, had $60 million in a discretionary fund to do the movie. And he was bragging to me that he had complete discretion. Flew me out here, two weeks later, he calls me up and says, Dr. Greer, they won't let me make this movie. So the reason the movies and the videos and the things you see in the mainstream media are all in this negative way is that there's somebody pulling the strings behind the scenes. And I'm going to throw out a challenge here that there's, if there's anyone in the film industry, documentary industry, or whatever in this town, I said this at Sundance, we'll do this movie with you, but we're going to have to see that the script is honest. And it's going to have to be from people who can fund it because the world is ready to hear the truth about this, but the controllers, I call them, don't want people to know the truth, and they want people to instead know the lie. Now, the ETs, if they were to just stampede into this and say, shut down these weapon systems and do this and do that, it would look like an alien invasion, and it would be spun that way. So the ETs are very patient and wise. What they're concerned about is that the public is increasingly being miseducated on this. And neither the President nor the UN Secretary General nor Hillary Clinton are doing anything to make peaceful contact. But that's changing. The fact that a G7 country writes me a letter to me personally and says we want to go on a long-term journey to make contact. Now, they're scared because they don't want to rattle Majestic's cage. And one of the things they said, we don't want to do this ahead of 
the Americans. I said, but the Americans are so dysfunctional. I said, you know, what people don't realize is that if you added together the defense budget of every nation on Earth, it'd be less than the United States defense budget. Added all of them up. China, England, Russia, France, Germany, Canada, all of them. So we lose more money every year in our budget that goes into the black budget than the biggest budgets in any other country in the world. And this crazy thousand-headed Medusa is not controlled any longer by the Congress and the President adequately. And so in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, and I, I had a lucid dream years ago where I was at a place and the United States Air Force and military were facilitating a daytime landing that was being shown to the whole world and the C-SETI senior team was there and an ET craft landed and the whole world saw it. I see a day coming where we will have the cooperation, that the swords will be beaten in the plowshares, that there will be this transformation. We're not quite there yet. And the ETs, one of the hard things for me is the patience factor, because I've had to find enormous patience to go through this process over the last 18 years. But the ETs have been around for thousands and millions of years. And they, they see the potential, and they see the, the, the risks. But they know that ultimately, change won't be real if we, the children of Earth, don't make it happen. So I tell people to avoid cosmic codependency, the sort of codependency where Big Brother from space is going to fix all of our problems. We're here. We're the children. And every single person can become enlightened and awake and empowered. And once we do that and we take our power and we make this transformation happen, then you're going to find that the whole cosmos is there on your shoulder helping you. And that's what we found with these contact experiences and with disclosure. And we're hoping to find with the, the, the orionproject.org, which is we're trying to bring these technologies out, that's been the hardest nut to crack. Making contact, do it all the time. Disclosure, we've already done it. 70% of the world believes ETs are here. UFOs are real. Bringing out the technologies, tough, tough. That's been the hardest, most difficult thing I've ever done because that's run, making a run at the heart of their power, of the kingdom, of, of this uh, secret, invisible government. But uh, that'll happen too, one way or another. I just hope it's not too late. Um, you know, the Earth, I, I first found God through Gaia and nature. And after I had my near-death experience, it, it deepened. But even before then, and what, I, what Earth has said to me, when I went out into space once with the ETs, and this is in, in the book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, and I had this meeting with Earth, and she said how much she loved her children, but how sad she was. There was a melancholy about what we were doing to her. And that but this wouldn't go on for too, too much longer, because it couldn't. And the Earth is here to be the womb of the evolution of intelligent and light and life for hundreds of thousands and millions of years. And it just isn't appropriate that one generation of feckless, materialistic, um, misguided people destroy that. So the earth has her own wisdom. And the saying, the earth shall cast off her burden, is a cautionary tale. And at a certain point, it's an act of compassion for the future generations to not let the current one destroy everything. And we're bumping up, we're redlining this. We're going right against the line of how much damage and abuse we can do to the Earth. And there's been 100 years that we should have had free energy, anti-gravity, all of this, and instead we've stayed on this path of global destruction. And so I tell people that this can only be allowed for so much longer, and, but it's in our hands, those of us on Earth. And we have to take responsibility for that. The extraterrestrial civilizations are here to understand and to help behind the scenes. And if things get really bad, it'll be not behind the scenes. But that's a worst case scenario. I hope we can do better than that. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to make it through, you see. And this old cycle is going to wind down. It's being folded up right before our eyes. All the institutions, all the things that are collapsing. There's a new thing 
that's being born. And I tell people we're cosmic midwives, okay? We're giving birth to this new world. And all of us need to say, how can we take care of this new life and this new time? And that's really what all of us can do. And it doesn't matter whether we do a little or a lot, so that's what we're doing. Because ultimately, you have to understand the landscape and the obstacles out there of what's going on in classified projects. But to me, that's not where the action is. The action is in, is in spirit and in consciousness and our actions together as a people making a new civilization a reality. And this is something every one of us has the sacred obligation to do. And the ETs will help us. I mean, they, they help me all the time in ways that I don't go into a lot because people wouldn't believe it. But, you know, they do. <laughs> and when I first started the Disclosures Project Starlight, if you get the Associated Press released all this stuff from the Clinton Library, and I, I was sitting in my living room and I told my wife, I said, you know, I really need to get this information to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Five minutes later, the phone rings, and this woman, wonderful spiritual woman, one of the New York 100, you know, families, calls me up and says, Dr. Greer, would you come up to a meeting because uh, Boutrous Ghali, who was the Secretary General at the time, is coming, they're so interested in what you're doing, making contact for peaceful purposes. So I went. And, and it's like, there, the, you know, spirit works in mysterious ways, the ETs do, and all this is happening. So, and I find that if you put yourself at service to that in a selfless way, it happens. And selfless doesn't mean passive, however. I have a very strong ego, but I'm very selfless. Those are not mutually exclusive things. You've got to stand tall, you need to speak truth to power, and you've got to find your power and do it. It's enough of sitting around in sackcloth and ashes and sitting shiva. You know, we've got to get up and stand up as a people and make this world a reality. And that's why all of us are on this planet right now, because we're at this pivotal, final countdown to transformation of life on Earth. And it is all of our job to do that. Yes, ma'am. You know, at this whole expo, we've been hearing everything about 2012 from polar shifts to the Mayan calendar to we're going to other dimensional shifts right. and the spacecrafts are going to come and take some of us up there. Have you gotten any insight either through your meditations or directly? I'd love to know if they've told you what's coming 2012. Yes, but the 2012 may not be quite the accurate date, although we manifest it. Remember, the minds of our individuality and collective manifest a reality. And 2012 was actually a time of celebration in the Mayan calendar. It was the ending of one cycle and the opening of another. And that is what I tell people. Now, the creation of this whole new era of enlightenment, of universal and world peace, may be attended by certain house cleanings. But a house cleaning, all right, of the old dreck garbage. Now, that can be as painful and disruptive or smooth as we intend it collectively. Now, prognostically, looking at where we are and where we should be, could be, one can be forgiven for not being sanguine that you know, it, it, it's going to be an easy transition. I think easy would have been between 1880 and 1910. Difficult would have been between 1910 and 1940s. Extremely difficult would have been between the 40s and the 90s. And now we're at the red line. You know, we're at V1. If you're, if you're a pilot and you're going down a runway, you reach a speed where you have to either shut the engines down or take off. And we're at that, we're at V1, V as in Victor, one as a civilization, where we have to either take off or it'll be temporarily shut down and rebooted because we cannot continue to cannibalize the Earth, go out into space with these electromagnetic weapon systems, and keep hoaxing war upon war. And that's what we're doing because the, the whole thing with all these movies and with, I hate to say it, 90% of the, the New Age and UFO crowd who talk, talks about the evil aliens and the good aliens and the, this, they're just laying the foundation for the Mormon-esque Scientological final battle in space nonsense. And I tell people, you know, this is not where we're supposed to be because the time of universal peace is here. And that does not mean interplanetary war. And it does not mean continue. So the, how this transition plays out 
has a lot to do. Now, things can happen quickly. You know, I, you, you look at people talking about Egypt, and I, I've been to Egypt. I, you know, I had the last night of my honeymoon on Mount Sinai. My Jewish mother-in-law went, oh, oy vey, you'll be struck dead by God, you know, having... I don't know if our first child was conceived there. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> outrageous and shocking. But uh, that what happened is that this is, this is what you have to entertain, is that the changes that you saw happen in Egypt happened in 18 days or whatever it was. Once a group of people come together, and that was sort of a political thing, and in a sense, you know, but these other changes, that's about coming together. And that's why I'm really excited. You know, I'm out here, I'm going to meet with some people about having a huge uh, uh, concert with you know, millions of people seeing it, where we'd have some of the biggest artists in history there who were really into this subject. You know, people like uh, you know, 30 Seconds to Mars and Blink-182 and uh, all these guys who were really into what we're doing. Um, so so that's, that's really exciting. But I think that one, one of the things that, that I'm concerned about most is that people not look to the past to gauge the future, because the future is on an accelerated path. And when we had Bijou, this ET from Andromeda, materialized and posed, turned and posed like this in the photo, it's the most important photograph ever taken in the history of ET stuff, because it's an actual photograph of a diplomatic m mission from our planet to theirs, and they responded, and the ET actually is there saying hello. Uh, that that is something so amazing, and that that just happened 15 months ago, that we're on this accelerated course where transformation is inevitable, contact is inevitable. The details of how it plays out can be a thousand different ways, but that has to do with our consciousness and our actions individually and collectively more than any predetermined thing. And I tell people, stay in that vision, the vision of a new world, universal peace, abundance, justice, God consciousness, interstellar travel, the future of the human race. This is what's in our hands, and we're all here to make that happen. God bless you. Namaste. Namaste. Good, good.